Um, I'm Faith Makishi. I'm a performance artist or live artist, originally from Honolulu, Hawaii, but I currently live here in Dalston, London. And people often ask me, what is live art? And it's kind of tricky because live art doesn't like to be defined. Live art begs, borrows, and steals from any existing art forms like theater, visual art, dance, in order to adapt to any context. And you know, today when I was thinking about what I was going to share with you, I actually figured out that I've been working professionally for nearly 40 years. I mean, I can't believe it. But you know, I think one of the reasons I've lasted this long is because I consider myself a professional amateur. Now, the word amateur originates from the French, meaning lover of, not expert. But if I were an expert in anything, it would be in aliveness. My job as a live artist is to follow the aliveness, to stay as close to aliveness as I can. So whenever I approach any kind of creative art project or public talk like this one, I ask myself these questions. What's alive for me right now? And what wants to be expressed through me? So tonight it's International Women's Day. And what's alive for me is homesickness. Homesickness shows up a lot in my work. And I often feel this deep longing for connection. You know, connection to others. Connection to creativity, connection to mystery, and connection to home. So tonight I want to share some background about my life as an artist. And also, I want to share some bits of my performance work with you, with the intention of taking you back home, back to Aloha, back to love. So how is, how is that? Does that sound good to you? So if you're willing, and if you feel like it, I want you to just turn off your video camera. And let's talk about Freud. All right. So Freud says that love is homesickness. And I guess what that means is to feel love, to feel longing, maybe even to feel lost because love and loss are two sides of the same thing. And it seems right now with the pandemic, the war against Ukraine, climate, it's plunged the whole world into loss. It's like we're experiencing a collective global homesickness. We're feeling homesick while stuck inside our own home. The homesick and we're sick at home. Okay, so it's really important that you know what I mean by this homesick, sick at home feeling. And to do this, I want you to just close your eyes and imagine standing in front of your refrigerator. It's like you crave something, but you're not really hungry. Now, the Japanese have a word for this feeling. Kuchi sabishi. Kuchi means mouth, and sabishi means lonely. You eat not because you're hungry, but because your mouth is lonely. I don't know, maybe you want cheese, or have a just sick of cheese. But you want something cheesy, but not cheese. You want cheese beyond cheese. It's like home. You sit at home, but you just want to go home already. You want home beyond home. And I want to take you home. But to do that, I'm going to have to ask your heart a hard question. So the question is what is the feeling you're unwilling to feel? Because there's no way home but through. 
Okay, so that was a bit of a performance that I created for the lockdown. And it was called Homewood House Sound. It was a one-to-one -one performance that happened over the phone. And it took the form of a ritual that asked people to move different rooms in their homes and to have a sacred encounter with everyday objects like the fridge or the toilet or the kettle. And in order for the ritual to be truly transformational, I had to take people into painful emotional places. Places we don't want to go. Places I don't want to go. But there is no way home but through. I've always felt this powerful urge to express human feelings. And the first performance I can remember was when I was about four years old. I watched a dead lizard being eaten by ants. And I felt overwhelmed by this strong feeling that I couldn't find words for. I mean, it wasn't only horror or curiosity or fear. It was something, something mysterious. And the strong feeling was alive and it compelled me to move, to perform. When I put on my red skirt, I grabbed the bathroom stool and placed it over the scene of the lizards and the ants. And with my skirt raised above my head, I hollered, hey, everybody, come look. And then I chanted, chim chimney, chim chimney, chim chimney is happening. <laughs> and you know, even now, I feel a deep calling. So, Make people gather and to bear witness to mystery. I always felt an intimacy with mystery to this indescribable it. And when I asked the grown up, they told me it was called God and that I was a seeker. And I gotta say, it felt great to be given an answer and even a job description. So when I turned 18, I went teaching at Sacramento Bible Institute. But when I got there, I couldn't find God. I mean, where the hell was God? And my whole world crashed. And I went into a depression. But eventually, I found God again in art. And they suppose what I was and what I'm still searching for is mystery. Francis Bacon said that the function of art is to deepen the mystery. And I think one could say the same thing about spirituality. Susan Langer wrote a book called Feeling and Form, and she defined art as the creation of forms symbolic of human feelings not mirrors to the world, not entertainment, not sermons or instructions or answers, not even beauty, but the creation of forms symbolic of human feelings. Humans are symbol-making creatures, and when we encounter mystery, like a lizard being eaten by ants, we try to get close to it to have an intimate dialogue with us by making something in response to it. I call this a creative response. And whenever I get that pow powerful image-making urge, my whole body tries to grab or grasp or contort myself around a form to express this breathing, dying chaos, chaos of experience a story or a painting or a performance is an art form that's trying to express to you, this is how it is for me. And I do this because I don't want to be all alone in this chaos. And in a perfect world, you would make a creative response back. And in this exchange, the world is less lonely, more creative, and alive. Okay, so I left 
um, Bible school at 18. And by age 19, I was working at the comedy store. It was by accident. Believe me, it wasn't because I was funny. All I did was get up and tell people what a shitty week I had. Mostly I would cry, but some people thought that was funny. And I don't know who said this, but um, comedians become comedians so they can control why people laugh at them. Okay, so I wore glasses like this um, since I was seven, and I got into fights every day. And I learned that the best defense against bullies was to beat them with better punchlines. Humor is power. It puts me in control. But being in control is not the same as having authentic human connection. So I decided to end my comedy career and I graduated at the University of Hawaii in storytelling. So I guess my work is a short story told by a short human. Frank O'Connor said, always in the short story, there is this sense of outlawed figures wandering about the fringes of society. And there is, in the short story, at its most characteristic, something we don't often find in the novel an intense awareness of human loneliness. That really resonates for me, that outside looking in feeling. And I used to wonder if it was because I was foreign. And then I wondered if it's because I'm queer. But to be really honest, this homesick feeling happens whenever I leave myself. I leave myself whenever I go into judgment mode. When I tell myself I need to perform or perfect, to please or prove that I'm worthy of love and belonging. And you know what? I spent so much of my life trying to skirt around the edges. I mean, I crave attention, but I don't want to be exposed. I want to be seen, but I don't want to be judged. But throughout my career, I never really participated in talks like this or interviews. And this is why. Whenever I'm invited to do an interview, at first I'm excited. I mean, I love attention. But then a part of me says, oh no, I won't say anything good enough. I don't deserve attention. And then another part chimes in and it says, well, if they're not going to be good enough, at least say something shocking, because hopefully it will distract how boring and inadequate you are. So whenever I hit an awkward or inadequate moment, I would expose myself and then feel shame. And sometimes in an attempt to distract you from that shameful moment, I stage it with something even more shameful. Fuck them. So when this kind of stuff happened, I'd call my mom, who also suffered from the same affliction. And my mom would say something equally weird, like they should say stage. You just want to belong. And in your desperation, your mind, your zipper gets undone. And something weird and shocking and vulnerable pops out. Yes, you feel out of control, Stacey. But you can't be in control and in love at the same time. Next time, unzip your heart. So I'm beginning to realize that there might be other ways to be myself without being shocking or shaming myself. I can just be vulnerable. It sounds easy, but it's not. On the other hand, the vulnerability is the only way to have true connection. So I'm coming to the end, but before I say aloha, I just wanna unzip your heart. And this is something I want to offer anyone out there who's feeling a little bit homesick. I'd like to invite you to just close your eyes. And I want you to imagine somebody who really needs you. It could be someone from the past or the present, someone dead or alive, someone who really gets you. 
Come in here, you. We adore you. You can see it in their eyes. Love and pride. In their eyes, you are amazing. You're the one for only you. And now if you can, I want you to invite more love to you. To be from the past or the present. People near or far. Maybe even your dog or cat. Imagine them all in front of you. They're all right here. I really see you taking in your strength with character, your own special bond of aliveness. Maybe now you might notice there are loved ones behind you. Maybe they're your ancestors. I want you to know they've got your back. We want you to know that you've exceeded the largest dreams. And you can open your heart to feel all this love. Take it all the way in. This is what it feels to belong. This is what it feels to come home. Thank you so much. I wish you a wonderful evening. Welcome home and aloha. Thank you so much, Stacey. That was wonderful and such a lovely way to start our event too. We will all miss you because I know that you're busy. Um, and um, so thank you very much for joining us with your busy schedule. Um, that was really, really great. Um, and hopefully, you know, we can work together at the meeting house very soon. I know you've got some interesting artwork, you know, and some things coming up. So lots to look forward to. Thank you again. Right, I'm going to pass over now to um, Ferida, who's going to talk a bit about her research and work. One second. There we go. Over Let's, to you. Thank you. Let me share my screen. Can you see? Yeah, yep. that looks great. Excellent. OK. Um, hello, um, I'm Feride, Feride Kumbasar. Um, at the moment, I am a PhD candidate at Roehampton University. But in my previous life, I was full time uh, working at uh, different community and voluntary sector organizations. I worked with refugees. I worked with young people. Um, in my last full-time position, uh, I worked for Image a Women's Center just around the corner of uh, Newington Green. For I led the organization for nine years. And 2017, I actually um, left my job to pursue my uh, PhD research. And this research is very close to my heart because I am Turkish and the research is about um, Turkish Kurdish women uh, migrant workers in Hackney. Um, today, I would like to, to um, talk about the Turkish Kurdish women's placemaking activities through their stories uh, to highlight how they contributed towards making uh, Hackney today. Um, I am. I, um, I don't want to use homemaking um, because for some women, uh, home is very um, complicated subject. If woman is experiencing violence, if they are um, trying to run away from, uh, you know, traditional roles uh, and patriarchal household, home is not a safe place and they might not have, um, homesick um, feelings in the sense that we have it. So therefore I am uh, using placemaking and placemaking means uh, creating, producing a space that is familiar to, to you, 
um, culturally, politically, socially is a familiar space. And today I am going to talk about uh, that. My PhD research is in oral history, as I said, and the woman who worked in garment making uh, factories, um, um, let me see, okay. Um, who worked in garment making factories and settled in, or worked in Hackney. So oral history is important because it is um, actually give alternative voices to the official history, and especially the marginalized sections of the communities can find a way of putting their input to the uh, history. And I am hoping through this uh, PhD research, I'm hoping to break the Turkish Kurdish woman's invisibility in Hackney history. Um, let me move. Um, so following the military coup in Turkey in 1980, and also the um, armed conflict between Kurdish um, and Turkish state intensified, um, we have large flux of refugees um, arrived from Turkey, especially um, between 1980 and mid, until mid nineties. Um, and in those as in 19, 89, for example, on 3rd of May, uh, um, only Getwick received like uh, 122 refugees. Um, and the, on daily basis, the refugees were arriving like 300, 400 of them. Um, and Hackney uh, um, found it very difficult to cope with them. So the community organizations, there weren't many at that time, there were only two, three. Um, in Hackney, there was Hulk Heavy. Um, they were actually um, accommodating them. So along with those refugees, there were women from diverse backgrounds. Um, there were women who are highly qualified. There were women who majority were, of them were uh, illiterate. Um, and there were women from urban areas, majority, again, many women from rural areas arrived. There were students, there were women on OPA visa. Um, one of the things that brought them together was finding employment in garment making factories. Um, many women um, around my circle and, and the women I interviewed, they all said that, you know, everybody, uh, either a week, the shortest period would be a week, or um, three months, six months. It doesn't matter whether they are here for, to, to learn English, they actually worked in those factories because it was easy to find a job. And the way they find the job was through their own networks. And sometimes those in, uh, networks included the links, transnational links from their home country as well. So those, um, they didn't need to speak any language, um, any word of English. They didn't need to have any sewing skills. Um, they, nobody was checking their work per, working permits. So they were just next day of their arrival, many of them stated that, um, they actually worked in those factories. And um, around that time, the, the Hackney, um, according to some records, had over uh, 2,000 small workshops and over like 20,000 people were working in those small workshops. And along with Turkish Kurdish, there were Bangl Bangladeshi, Pakistani, from different migrants of Af um, uh, communities from Africa, different migrant groups were working. Um, so it continued until mid nineties and, and the textile uh, factories, uh, textile industry collapsed in 19, mid nineties. And the small, those small workshops actually uh, moved to um, Eastern European countries or Portugal for, for example, because the, the 
labor was cheaper, I suppose. Um, those women workers, um, doesn't matter which background they were from, um, became unemployed. And uh, the women who didn't have any other skills um, and didn't uh, learn any English, they actually um, came together as a family members and used the resources of the extended uh, family members and set up their own businesses. So um, suddenly on Hackney streets, you had um, hundreds of shops popping up like restaurants, kebab houses, cafes. And those uh, women who uh, used to work in factories started working in those uh, family businesses as cooks, waitress, you know, cleaners. So they were the driving force of um, the running of those businesses. Um, and during that time, some uh, woman gained, um, you know, found, uh, thought that it was an opportunity or they didn't have enough saving to open uh, business. They uh, requalified themselves, they learned the language, but they utilized their um, political activist uh, community organizing skills to uh, actually find employment in community development field, social work field. So um, in, when um, we consider uh, the placemaking uh, in terms of Turkish Kurdish women, um, we can see that different layers of placemaking happened. On one hand, for example, through those small businesses, they brought in the language, their own language to the city. So on the streets you had um, you know, the shops uh, having names of different Turkish cities, uh, the women's names like uh, Hazal, Özlem, or Istanbul restaurant as a city name. So on the, um, especially on Stock Newington High Street towards Dalston, you have, uh, you, um, you have no chance not to be exposed to those uh, Turkish words. So one way of making a place to be familiar through language for them. And then um, another way they used is bringing in their dishes, you know, um, the cuisine, Turkish cuisine introduced to the um, wider society. Um, and also their fashion, their, uh, the way of they do things. Um, so the third way is, um, and I would like to focus on that because of the International uh, Women's Day, <laughs> um, is actually uh, claiming the streets and making public spaces as sites of struggle and resistance. Um, for that, you know, women organized under uh, those, um, the political groups they came um, together with, um, they were, um, you know, towards the mid 90, towards the end of 90s, we had community organizations as well, different community organizations, along with Halkevi, there were, there was that, uh, Daimar was set up in Newington Green, Gikta was in, on um, Stoke Newington, and then uh, many others as well. So um, women, um, on one hand, women organized in those community organizations, but on the other hand, women was, was uh, trying to establish their own uh, women-only spaces. So, um, the women activists uh, and the intellectuals who uh, ran away from uh, the military coup in 1980, um, they started actually meeting um, early 80s, uh, meeting at homes and start discussing uh, their um, experiences in, in the socialist Marxist organizations as women, they started discussing about their own experiences, how it is not, um, or whether it is 
or not transfer to the organization's politics, etc. And the, the group is called uh, Londra Kadın Grubu. It was an informal group and it was very inclusive. It was, um, it, you know, uh, it, it had members from, it didn't have membership actually. Uh, the woman was coming from different backgrounds, joining in. Um, and the group um, also organizing campaigns um, on issue-based campaigns, campaigns like uh, violence against uh, women campaigns. Um, so one of the uh, women who actually joined this group uh, was the participant of the research and she said, I was not political. My involvement to London, a, a Londra, London Women's Group or Londra Kadın Group. Um, okay. um, group was because I thought uh, our womanhood was um, enough to come together and fight for gender equality. I ran away from a marriage, refused to take traditional gender role. Here I was hoping to establish a new life as a woman. Violence against women incidents were increasing. In the same year, three women were killed by their partners. So we had to do any, uh, something. I think she's talking about 1989. Um, between 1988 and 1989, um, there were three women killed in, in the very close area of Stoke Newington, Dalston, uh, by their partners um, because a woman started um, earning money and it created some kind of uh, uh, shake in the traditional gender role in household and that created conflict as well. Um, in those uh, factories, majority were, uh, workers were women um, and men uh, only um, very uh, small number, I mean like 30% of the factories were men, uh, they say. So she joined that and we organized uh, a woman's march, made placards, banners, the same discussion started and we were divided. Whether should men or socialist men attend? So she's talking about the march. Uh, some were against, also I was. Um, this is another woman actually talking about the same uh, same group. And then the first woman, Zeynep, uh, says, many women left after uh, that campaign. We continued our lives as friends. We never talked about it afterwards. We wrote some nasty letters to each other, but never talked about what happened to us. So um, I suppose it is, uh, it happened in every uh, woman's uh, movement um, in the world. Um, there is, um, you know, ideological or uh, political differences among the women's movement. And um, there is always separations, div uh, divisions. And when it comes to the woman uh, division and, or separation, it is painful as well. And Zeynep talks about that pain that they never actually uh, face that pain. During that time, um, there was another um, umbrella group was set up uh, by the socialist and Marxist feminists. Um, they set up around 89. Um, they were meeting once in a week uh, regularly uh, in Dalston. Uh, and it was called Socialist Women's uh, uh, Workers Union. And they met about two, three years afterwards. And she's uh, one of the uh, member is saying, I was attending London Women's uh, Groups campaigns and wider meetings. One happened at Hackney Council. She's talking about the other, uh, other group that I mentioned earlier. Priorities were, were not meeting the needs of our women's, women workers. She's talking about the textile uh, factory workers she worked in the factory uh, and 
when she says poor conditions, it means the factory conditions she's talking about. Um, you know, we socialist women came together and started organizing our own meetings. More women from rural backgrounds joined us. So uh, she, this is another um, woman group trying to um, produce a woman only space for themselves. Although they didn't want to leave the uh, identity as socialist uh, or Marxist feminist, but they also wanted to have their own uh, woman only space. Apart from that, uh, the women who were um, working in the factories and living with their partners uh, here together with their families, they were also uh, socializing in community organizations in mixed environment with their partners. And while uh, community organizations, um, while they were attending those community organizations, they started actually organizing um, uh, women meetings um, and they took part in, um, in those women meetings also along with their um, partners and male co comrades, they attended the uh, demonstrations. So those community organizations were actually a uh, first step for many women to become politicized, uh, to, become, to take part in political activities. Um, and that actually, uh, although it wasn't, um, you know, for many um, uh, feminist, it, it can be seen from a feminist perspective as, as uh, it is not a woman only uh, activity. They were actually following the community organization's uh, agenda, but because they were politicized and they were taking part in those marches, their um, agency, uh, you know, they, it enhanced their agency and it actually um, widened their social participation, uh, scope for social participation. Um, during that time, many women didn't have full uh, citizenship rights. They didn't have any, um, position or right to uh, make decision for wider uh, in, in their position in the wider society. But through those community organizations, they were using the power uh, to um, make their own priorities. They were using uh, uh, decision make, making power to use uh, public resources, for example. So these are all uh, important elements for the development of the woman workers' um, identities um, in terms of political identities, and also claiming the uh, claiming the streets uh, to make them familiar for uh, their for their own space. Um, Sometimes, of course, uh, those uh, in those organizations, uh, the priorities came into conflict, and um, many women um, left those organizations because of that. Um, uh, you know, these, these from the London uh, Women's Group. Um, the in participants said London Women's Group was maybe chaotic as we had endless discussion on everything until we, he uh, we wear each other out. But we now have an established woman only organization, Image. Um, it is the only organization, isn't it, as service providers. So she celebrated for their achievements. Yes, it is, uh, Image is the only woman on the organization and it is um, providing service to um, around 3,000, 4,000 women every year. Um, 
Ayşe is talking about the community organization, um, how, why she left the community organization. So she organized, she was part of the women's group in the uh, community organization. She says, we left because of the patriarchal structure. How can I say we, women, wanted to get organized, raise our issues and have our say. A woman was beaten by her comrade. She was from one of the leftist groups that was part of the Halkevi's management committee. It was a coalition committee. You see, we organized a women's meeting in the library to discuss this incident and support her. And the library is inside the Halkevi. The meeting was attacked by male members from her political group who insisted that it was an internal, an internal matter. We were not asked to um, involve. Some of us had to jump out of the windows. That was the last time I stepped into this building. Um, so this is when the priorities or, uh, or the um, positioning gen gender discrimination, gender exclusionary policies came into the uh, mixed uh, organization. So they, they took uh, different uh, routes. Some of them took a uh, route to set up their own um, woman-only spaces. Some of them actually um, tried to set up umbrella groups rather than losing their contact with, the, uh, with their own uh, organization, social organization, but they continued claiming the streets. Um, this is, for example, is uh, taken from the early times of International Women's uh, Day March. Um, I think it is mid nineties. Uh, so it is the Dimers Women's Group, but also you can see that there are uh, men uh, marching with them. Um, the one thing about the migrant, uh, Turkish Kurdish migrant group, they had to pursue uh, the, um, you know, they had to follow the agenda of the um, home country and they have to uh, develop strategies to struggle against and, and resist those um, policies in home country as well as the policies in the settled country. Um, it is not because they are not fully settled in this country, but because many of them, as they stated, they are Londoners as well as they are from Turkey. They feel that they are Londoners as, as well as uh, Turkey. Uh, Turkey. Um, so these are how you know, they join, for example, the Women's March in West London, but they also organize a Women's March in the um, areas where Turkish Kurdish population is, um, um, you know, big. Um, for example, very recently they attended, uh, many women attended the march in West London, but also they also organized a march in Enfield where the Turkish Kurdish, uh, majority of Turkish Kurdish population are now living, is now living. Um, I am not trying to, um, I mean, I just wanted to say uh, that Turkish Kurdish woman is not a homogeneous um, category. I mean, I am not trying to typology, uh, create a typology or an ideal type of Turkishness and Kurdishness. In, instead, I am trying to show that they are coming from diverse backgrounds, diverse political uh, positioning, yet, uh, being migrant and being settled in one geography brought them together uh, through uh, labor and sharing the um, experience of uh, migration. Um, they, they, they create um, 
a space that they can share, whether uh, they are uh, diverse ethnically, sexually, or um, gen um, on gender or uh, class. Thank you very much. I think I'm over time, is it? Thank you so much, Farida. That is fascinating. And I know we've spoken before, but I learned so much from that presentation, uh, being able to listen to you talk about it more in depth. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, and as I said before, Farida is putting together an exhibition in, it's July, isn't it, Farida, at the Meeting House? Yes. Yeah, in July. In June. June. June, in June, and um, June. yeah, yeah, and um, we will contact you. know, if you go onto the new new Inter Green Meeting House website and uh, things, then we can let you know. There's a mailing list every month, and uh, you can come along, and it would be great. And some of those amazing photographs that Ferida um, showed, there's going to be more of those, and there'll be the the oral histories um, that she's recorded too. Um, so thanks, Ferida. We're going to pass <laughs> now over to. Uh, Laura, who is going to uh, tell us a little bit about another fantastic organisation with a really important history, which is the Girls Friendly Society. So thanks, Laura. Thank you very much, Amy. Thank you, Ferida. That was so inspiring. A real case of um, sisterhood in action, I think. Um, really perfect for today um, and you your message was very strong um, and very clear um, and Stacey before you so soulful and and thoughtful um, this is not fun following you two speakers I have to be honest with you <laughs> um, so um, my name is Laura Laura Serkam I have the real pleasure and honour of being the current chief executive of uh, Girls Friendly Society, um, currently known um, as GFS. And I say currently quite a few times because we're very much caretakers in this organisation that has been running for almost 150 years now. So a huge part of um, uh, the, the history behind uh, girls and women and their development. Um, as far as we know, we're the only feminist um, charity um, working in the UK, working with girls and young women. And we work with girls and young women to address gender inequality. So today what I'm going to do is just, um, I've been asked to just have a look at some of the history of the organisation, very much like Farida really, and kind of bring it up to date and talk about what we're, we're looking at now um, in terms of um, women and equality. So this is a very um, beautiful old picture um, right back um, in the day and kind of, um, just shows you where we've come from really in terms of our history. Our vision and mission are really strong and really current for us at the moment. So our vision is of a world where girls and young women feel proud to be themselves, uh, free to be themselves and feel proud of who they are. And we felt actually in developing these and refreshing these, that was a seriously brave ambition because I'm not sure if anyone in this room knows of a girl or a young woman who feels totally free to be themselves, especially right now, there's so many pressures on girls and who feels proud of who they are. You know, there are so many girls who have concerns and worries about themselves. And so our mission, our part in achieving that vision is all about su supporting and inspiring girls and young women. And we do that through our girls groups, um, Hackney being the closest one, um, where um, we create spaces where the girls can feel safe and valued. And that was something that girls felt very strongly. They wanted a safe space for them um, and where they can build strong foundations to prepare them for life's challenges. Um, these are our values. These are the things that we use to um, judge ourselves, judge our program development and the criteria which we build um, new services around. We um, aim to be ambitious, brave, girl focused, feminist, fun and inclusive. Fun is really, really important for the girls. You know, they're not going to come and hang out with us if we're not fun to be with. Um, but um, we run feminist programmes um, and I sometimes call them feminist by stealth, actually. It looks sometimes like um, a fun activity. They're building something together, maybe some craft or they're having a conversation. But underpinning that conversation is very much kind of a theme around inspiring them to be strong and independent. Um, the um, 
organization was founded in 1875 by an amazing woman called Mary Townsend, who we constantly feel a pressure to live up to her incredible kind of um, starting point. Um, by the end of that first year, she had 3,000 members, that's 3,000 um, girls and uh, women, and she was running 25 groups um, throughout the country. Um, Five years later, that had grown from 3,000 people she was touching to 40,000 people. And just bear in mind, this is before social media. You know, this is before um, we had the um, opportunity to share ideas and opportunities. Her growth was absolutely incredible. Um, Ten years later, that had grown to 150,000 um, with um, 1,300 groups for girls and young women. And then they went worldwide. So GFS is a worldwide um, federation, really, where uh, we are now um, in England and Wales, just a small part of, of um, the worldwide um, setup. So Mary Townsend started something that has been fueled by and populated by um, the most incredible, unstoppable women. Initially, they started up um, because they recognised that, that women were coming in from big towns and cities from the countryside um, into um, service and work um, to support their wider family. And these women were really vulnerable and um, they were on their own. They were very young. They didn't have people looking out for them. And she felt really strongly that she could create a set of mentors that actually would be role models for those girls and would look out for them. Um, she quickly grew to diversifying the women that she was um, supporting and they were, as you can see, a whole range from teachers to workers in mills, factories, warehouses, anybody that she felt um, that they could support. And they actually turned into a bit of a social work service, you know, they would go into the lovely story um, on the I don't know if many of you remember Upstairs, Downstairs, the old series that used to be on TV. They did a whole um, episode around GFS and it showed um, a, a woman from GFS in a uniform going into a big house in London and challenging the woman of the house to say, um, I don't believe that your staff are being looked after well enough. I don't believe they're working and uh, they're living in um, fair accommodation and got got change, got change for those women. Um, if we fast forward a little bit, um, and I have to speak quite quickly because the, the history is such a long um, history. Um, but fast forward a bit, after the First World War, um, they changed, GFS changed, um, and it became, um, again, focusing on vulnerable um, girls and women, but victims of domestic um, abuse, um, they looked out for homeless women. They looked at bringing in education opportunities and focus on health and well-being. Take that forward to the Second World War, and actually they were um, looking at war training for 14 to 18-year-olds. They were supporting evacuees. And then they started um, what became well-known as um, in the youth sector as one of the early youth sector training programs um, for um, people working with uh, young people. Post-war, um, again, they were looking at training and development, but thinking then in, in, in that time, there was a real vulnerability around um, unmarried and young mothers and who was looking out for them because they were finding themselves homeless um, and thrown out by their families and not supported. Um, and so they set up housing schemes and projects around making sure that they were supported through all the way through the decades. GFS has morphed and changed to meet the need of vulnerable girls and women. This is a question for you, really. Um, I, I was thinking about Stacey's kind of thoughtful questions and, 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 and what she inspired us to do. And for you just to take a second to think about who was your role model? You know, did you have a Mary in your life? Did you have an amazing um, aunt or mum or teacher or sister or neighbour or somebody that looked out for you? who told you you were amazing, who gave you that confidence and instilled that, that, that sense of self-belief. Because if you did, you're really, really lucky. There are so many girls today who, who don't have that um, for lots and lots of reasons, but who don't have that. And Mary 
was aware of that back in 1875, which is why she started this incredible movement. The question that we are asked at GFS right now, um, and I'm sure uh, most of you in the room will recognize it. Well, isn't it okay now? Isn't everything sorted now? You know, this is 2022, women have got the vote, equal rights, Their girls are entitled to an education, whoop, whoop. Um, there is more awareness of child protection issues. You know, people are looking out for girls now, there's not a problem. Um, why do we have International Women's Day? That's a big question, isn't it, that is asked um, all of the time. And of course, things have got better in so many areas. Um, and we do even have some women in positions of senior leadership and power and decision making. Um, we do have the right to equal pay, but those of you who have seen Twitter today will see organisations being picked out and highlighted as having a considerable um, gender pay gap in their organisations, even those who are supporting International Women's Day and making a stand there, they're still not delivering on the ground. And actually, yeah, we can go out at night, but I'm sure there isn't a woman in this room who doesn't feel nervous in the dark walking home alone, who doesn't feel um, the need, the pressure to look over their shoulder, you know, as you leave the tube station um, to go up a dark, dark um, alleyway or roadside. Um, corporate uh, companies are often saying to us, businesses have done so much now, there are so many opportunities for women. Um, we created these special apprenticeships. We're looking at board opportunities, development opportunities, creating quotas for ourselves. But we know that the research says something really, really different. The volunteers that we work with say, actually, if they sit back and think about things, it's worse now than it was in 1875. And the thing that underpins all of this um, feeling that it's worse and not better is the confidence of girls and young women, because that's absolutely key. If businesses have done so much and created such opportunities for women, because of the fact that girls lose confidence so fast from the age of five, they start to lose confidence. And if we don't get in early and provide an early intervention program, then those girls won't become or won't retain their confidence and resilience, and they won't be confident young women, and they won't believe that they can apply for those opportunities. So whereas opportunities may be, um, <clears throat> may be there, and people are working to make things better, if we don't do something in the here and now to retain their confidence and resilience, then that's not gonna become a reality for them. So this is from research that is sitting out there right now. <clears throat> girls as young as five are routinely worried about their weight and their appearance. Girls as young as six sincerely believe that men are smarter than women. 67% of girls um, age 11 to 21 think that women don't have the same chances as men. And over 35% of girls say they're depressed compared to just 17% of boys. So we know that we, and we can see at our groups that girls start to see less opportunity for themselves and start to feel the need to do what their mum did or their aunt did or their grandmother did and just repeat history. They start to feel the need to fulfill gender stereotypes because they don't believe that those opportunities for them are for them. Since that research was published, it's just got worse and worse. So during COVID for um, girls and women, that was a really bad time. It was terrible time um, for, as I'm sure Mary Ann will allude to, is for uh, women generally who were disproportionately affected. The support for uh, young people has declined. It's gone down 69% since 2010. So the services aren't out there to support young people. And it's very much a postcode lottery. There's some fantastic research done by Plan UK that identified the worst places to live if you're a girl um, in England and Wales and Scotland. And that's where GFS Girls goes. We are starting new groups in the areas where Plan UK research says it's not a great place to live if you're a girl. We're going to the areas where girls need this support the most. 
and our job um, in groups like Hackney and Mile End, not so far away, um, are to in is really to interrupt the pattern so that girls don't lose that confidence. So they come to us at five, we retain that confidence, we build on that confidence so they can become confident, independent women. And we do that through developing um, their feelings about themselves around these six state statements. The one that I think underpins everything is I am proud of who I am. Because actually, if you are proud of who you are, then you can usually try new and unfamiliar things. You can believe in yourself. Um, you can um, be brave enough to um, have friendships with all kinds of people um, and speak up about the things that matter to you. So we create opportunities for local communities to get involved with our group by supporting us, um, by volunteering, by bringing organisations and companies that want to work with us. Um, and just this week, we've got an amazing opportunity where we've actually got support from the Big Give and any donation we receive through um, this particular website will get every donation doubled, um, which is really exciting um, for us. We've never been there before. So we're, we're really hoping that will help us reach more girls um, and give them an opportunity to try something new. And why do we do it? Um, well, this sort of thing comes in from um, parents all the time. Um, so Rebecca said, I'd like to thank GFS for helping my daughter gain her confidence, which is something she severely lacked whilst attending other clubs. She's learned that women can be whoever they want to be, and this has impacted her massively. Thank you so much for giving her all the opportunities to thrive in these areas. Um, that's a very different mum to the mum that first came to that group with a daughter that lacked confidence, that couldn't speak up for herself, that was um, so frightened um, to even contribute to conversation. And we always like to end with what the girls say, you know, um, because actually their voices are clearer than um, anybody else's. Um, and the one in yellow is um, just happened just recently. And it um, goes back to that girl statement of, speaking up about things that matter to me it's really pertinent to all of the stories we've heard in the press I think around women having confidence um, to say no to push back um, and um, say how they feel and this was a story um, that took place in Anfield Liverpool where um, a girl was really worried about the way that a boy was treating her and um, in the break during the group, she went up to the volunteer leader to say um, that actually I feel now I can stand up to him, um, which was a bit of a kind of point of celebration for us. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Laura. It was absolutely uh, a privilege to have you here to talk about the work of the Girls Friendly Society and learn more about that. And I think you did an amazing job um, covering all of that in such a short space of time. Um, but, um, you know, please everyone on the call, if you can, you know, donate to such an amazing uh, charity, please do. And Laura, if there's anything, you know, I really look forward to maybe working with the Girls Friendly Society in Hackney further in the future, because um, it sounds absolutely like what young women and girls need right now. So thank you so much. Thanks, and we're going to finish off now um, with Mary Ann from the Women's Budget Group. So I'm going to pass over to you now. Thank you very much. I'm just going to um, share my screen now so that I can do a slideshow. Let's try and find it. There we go. Um, OK, so I hope everyone can see that. Um, so I'm Mary Ann Stevenson. I'm the director of the UK Women's Budget Group. What we do is we um, analyse the impact of economic policy on women and men. Um, and in the last couple of years, we've done a great deal of work analysing the impact of COVID on, on different groups of women. Um, uh, so I'm just going to really talk through what's happened um, to women um, as a result of COVID and then where we are now, um, particularly with the cost of living crisis. Um, but I'd like to start with a um, slide that I use quite a lot, which is a kind of why are we in this situation in the first place? And this is this is about the kind of spiral of inequality. Um, and it's really there to show how 
unpaid care is at the heart of so much of the inequalities that women face. So women do um, 60% more unpaid work than men. Um, most of that's cared, care work, which means they have less time for paid work, um, more likely to work part time and in precarious employment, um, earn less per hour, are own less, are more likely to be poor, particularly in old age. Um, and therefore depend more on public services and social security for a larger part of their income, so are hit harder when those benefits are cut, but also um, face workplace discrimination because of the assumption that they will be the person who's doing the majority of the caring work, and so therefore employers discriminate against them. Um, and women also have um, are less likely to be represented in, in public life and in decision-making positions, again, back to this issue of, of care. And this obviously intersects with a whole load of other things. And there's a specific um, set of inequalities and issues around um, male violence against women, um, which uh, intersects with those issues around care, but also um, different groups of women face different sets of inequalities um, uh, around race, class, disability, sexuality, and so on. And this, um, this means that this, this pattern, this spiral plays out in different ways in different women's lives. But I think that's just a really important background to remember. That's why um, COVID affected women differently from men, because women were differently situated in the economy before COVID happened. Um, so to give to start with an overview of the impact of, of COVID on women, um, we know that women were the majority of those furloughed. Um, women were more likely to work in sectors of the economy that were completely closed during lockdown, particularly high street retail and hospitality, um, but also more likely to be key workers um, and to work particularly in health and social care. Um, we know that women did um, vastly more unpaid work than men um, when schools and nurseries closed. In fact, the Institute for Fiscal Studies did a uh, study of 5,000 um, heterosexual couples with children um, and they found that the only kind of work situation in which women didn't do more than men was where um, the mother was um, working out full-time outside the home and the father was either furloughed or unemployed and in those situations uh, couples shared care roughly equally um, but in all other situations women did more. And not surprisingly, uh, that meant that women's mental health deteriorated more than men's during the pandemic, um, and that women were ended up the majority of those struggling financially and in debt. Um, and we also know, as indeed was warned before the lockdown, that um, locking women at home, you know, keeping women trapped at home with their abusers, led to increased levels of, of femicide and domestic abuse. Um, but women weren't all affected equally. Um, I'm looking here at the kind of economic impact of COVID. There's a whole set of other health and, and other social impacts. Um, so we, the, the, the biggest um, uh, it, other issues that, that meant that women were affected differently were around class and income, around age, around race, around disability, and around motherhood. Um, so if we start with income, um, women predominate both before and after the pandemic in low paid and key worker jobs, which overlap. Um, and low paid workers were less likely to have their salaries topped up if they were furloughed by their employers. So the higher paid you were, the more likely your employer was to carry on paying you at the full rate. The lower paid you were, the more likely you were to be on 80 percent of earnings, which is obviously on a lower income to start off with. So higher, harder to live on. Um, and um, so what that meant was that while overall savings have increased during the pandemic, um, low income families increased levels of debt, while higher income families increased levels of savings. Um, and low income parents were more likely to lose their jobs um, and less likely to be able to work from home. Um, so there's a kind of assumption that during COVID, you know, everybody moved to home working. Um, working class women in particular 
less likely to be able to work from home and more likely to either be furloughed or to have to carry on work. Um, you look at age, there's a particular impact on young people. Young people were very heavily overrepresented in sectors that were completely shut down during COVID. Um, over a third of young women um, working in jobs like hospitality, high street retail, and so on. Um, and that meant um, millions of women, uh, young women, losing incomes and jobs and um, worsening mental health problems. And, and Laura touched on this in her presentation, you know, the mental health issues affecting girls carry on into the lives of young women. Um, but also that disruption in your working life at an early stage can have a scarring effect for the rest of your career. Um, that actually being out of work when you're young has a particularly bad effect. It's, it's worse than, than when you're older in some ways in terms of the long-term impact, because you've got less to fall back on and less experience to rely on. Um, on race, we know that um, employment um, for black and minority ethnic women was particularly badly hit. Um, and employment rates for black and minority ethnic workers, both women and men, fell more sharply than for white workers in a way that's not fully explained by the sectors that they worked in. So there's something else going on there. Um, and um, black and minority ethnic women had higher rates of unemployment and lower rates of employment than white women. Um, disabled women's finances were particularly badly hit. We did a survey um, in the first in the end of 2000, which showed that a third of um, disabled women at that point reported having run out of money as a result of the crisis compared to a quarter of non-disabled women. Um, and disabled women were, disabled mothers were more likely to be furloughed. Half of disabled mothers were furloughed. Um, and then there's this impact on motherhood. We've already talked about the fact that women were hit harder by additional unpaid work. Um, women as a whole did an hour a day more childcare than men. But actually, when you looked at mothers and fathers, that was vastly increased. Um, and a survey um, by Pregnant and Strood showed that nearly half of mothers who were made redundant during the COVID pandemic cited childcare as a factor in their redundancy. And that the TUC showed that even though um, parents were allowed to request furlough for childcare reasons, more than 70% of working mothers who requested furlough had that request denied. Um, so there was a real problem there. And this problem is particularly bad for single mothers. Um, single parents, um, and 90% of single parents are mothers, are single mothers, um, are significantly less likely to be working from home. Um, so during the pandemic, when um, uh, other parents, about 38% of other parents were increased, um, they're working from home. Uh, that was much lower for single parents, only 21% single parents were more likely to be furloughed rather than be able to work at home and to stay on furlough for a longer time. Um, and childcare costs, obviously, a particular problem for single parents, um, with um, nearly one in four saying childcare had caused particular debt problems for them. Um, so we're coming out of COVID with increased numbers of people in serious debt. Um, uh, I, over a year ago now, there were um, over 40 million adults who faced a fall in income and over 10 million um, showing signs of financial difficulty. Um, and uh, it's now um, over 2 million adults said they completely run down their savings. And, and the further group had used more than half of their savings to pay for essentials. And this has a knock on effect when we look at the cost of living increase now, because obviously those people don't have any cushion to um, manage increasing food and fuel costs. Um, post pandemic, um, we're seeing something interesting happening in the labour market. So overall in the UK, um, women didn't lose jobs in the numbers that they did in some other countries as a result of COVID. And that was partly a result of the, the furlough scheme, which actually was incredibly successful in keeping large numbers of people in, in the labour market. Um, but also, although some women lost jobs in hospitality and retail, uh, a greater number of women um, increased work in health and social care, which expanded in the last two years. Um, we're now facing quite a tight labour market. So we've got um, unemployment rates closer to the pre-crisis rates. 
um, and about 1.1 unemployed person per vacancy, which is which is generally a you know a, a tight labour market, which is generally good for people. But what that hides is a really significant increase in economic inactivity. Um, so uh, economically inactive is a really annoying term that is used by um, uh, people working on employment to mean people who are not um, in paid work or registered as unemployed. Um, and I mean, it's really annoying and patronising because it implies that people who are at home looking after their families, for example, are inactive. And obviously they are not inactive and they are fundamental to the economy. However, that's the term we have. So um, economic inactivity rates have increased by um, about 400,000 people. And the biggest increase is it was a result of long, long term sickness. Um, so people unable to work because of long term sickness. Um, and the increase in economic inactivity is highest among women aged 50 to 64. Um, and these are also the women who've been affected by um, the uh, increase in pension age. Um, and so I think what, what that, what's happening there is women who might have retired are now unable to retire, but they're also um, unable to do paid work. So they are economically inactive. Um, in terms of, of employment, um, where we are at the moment, um, women's employment rate is slightly down from where it was post pandemic, um, but not a huge amount. So we're nearly back up to those, those rates again. Um, and about um, uh, a third of women in the labor market are working part-time, 38% um, of women who work part-time and 13% um, of men. Um, we're also seeing a, a change in um, working patterns. So remote working has led to an increase in working hours for some people, um, particularly for um, mothers. So um, one uh, recent survey showed that 10% of mothers in couples said that they could increase their working hours because remote working was now a possibility at their work, which hadn't been there before. Um, and it makes it easier, you know, if you don't have to manage a commute as well as a school run or a nursery run, it's, it's easier to, to do paid work. But as I said earlier, um, that option is less open for large numbers of working class women who do jobs that can't be done remotely um, and uh, don't have those, those same opportunities. Um, but we're coming out of the pandemic and into a cost of living crisis. Um, and I think it's really important to stress here, this isn't just about rising prices. So we're seeing an increase in food and fuel prices, and we're likely to see um, fuel prices in particular increase still further um, because of the, the war in Ukraine and the impact that's having on, on oil and gas prices. Um, but this is also a crisis of low earnings, and it's a crisis that has been brewing for a long time, You know, over 10 years of austerity prior to COVID. Um, which meant that, for example, um, cuts to social security from um, 2010 until um, 2020 um, had amounted to 37 billion pounds a year um, by 2020. It's a huge amount of money taken out of the social security system. At the same time, about 41 billion pounds was cut from taxes a year over the same period. So you're seeing an almost direct transfer from um, uh, social security payments um, for one group to tax um, cuts to another group. Um, and the um, cut to the £20 uplift to universal credit um, is still leaving um, people significantly worse off, even though there were changes to universal credit um, in the autumn budget, which made things slightly better for people in paid work, for those who are not in paid work, that, that didn't um, uh, improve their situation. Um, Social security benefit rates are scheduled to increase by 3.1% um, in April. That's um, less than half the expected rate of inflation. The, the Resolution Foundation had a report out today um, predicting that um, the monthly high of inflation in the spring could be as high as 8.4% um, um, as a result of um, uh, costs to fuel and food in particular. Um, and the overall inflation rates over next over 2021 is liable to be around 7%, certainly higher than the Bank of England forecast in February. And as I said, 
pre-existing debt from COVID leaves a lot of people less able to cope with that. So we're in for a very, very difficult and tricky year for, for large numbers of people. Um, so what do we think should happen? Um, first of all, we need to make significant investment in social infrastructure, particularly care. As I said at the beginning, there is a reason why women um, are more likely to be poor than men and more likely to be dependent on social security, and that is because of their unpaid care responsibilities. Investing in social infrastructure, in social care and child care would um, uh, increase jobs um, and it would enable more people to enter the labour market. Um, we also need to ensure that social security is increased in line with inflation um, and end the benefit cap and the two child limit, which are completely unjustified. Um, we need to ensure that child care, child care element of universal credit is paid up front rather than in arrears because a lot of people get into debt when they first start claiming universal credit um, because they have to pay for their child care first. Um, and we need to end the no recourse to public funds rules, which mean that large numbers of migrant women are not entitled to support when they need it most. Um, and one of the ways to fund some of this would be through a windfall tax on utilities. Um, utility companies are actually making um, historically high levels of profit at the moment while fuel prices are going up. Um, so I'm sorry, that is not the most cheerful point on which to end these presentations, particularly after such kind of inspiring um, and uplifting talks. Um, but I was asked to set out what the situation was for women at the moment. Um, and I hope that I've done that. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I think actually that was a really great last um, thing because we've learned a lot about history and we've learned a lot about, um, you know, uh, the past and things like that. And then it's kind of bringing it up to the present. And I hope that will kind of maybe catalyze action for people on the call, you know, to get involved with local groups or international national levels. You know, I think um, I mean, I think everyone just should just shut up and listen to the women's budget group because that just sounds like you you know what needs to happen and it all sounds great. So thank you so much for taking the time, Mary Ann, to come and speak to us. You know, as the director again of the, you know, of such a, a big organization doing that kind of work, you know, we really appreciate it. And it was really fascinating to hear about the work that you do much more in depth. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, well, it is eight o'clock, but I'm wondering which is when we were supposed to finish this event. Um, but obviously, we haven't had any opportunity for anyone to ask any questions. So um, speakers and anyone on the call, if you um, want to go now, it's eight o'clock, then please do. But if anyone um, has any questions, I think that, um, you know, I'm quite happy to say that we'll stay here for another 10 minutes maximum, just to make sure that people get a chance to um, ask a question. So please fire away in the chat if you have a, any questions. Um, you can write your question in the chat or if you would like to, you can unmute yourself and ask um, or maybe put in the chat that you would like to do that. Um, I mean, Ferida, I actually um, had one for you. You mentioned about the many different you know women that were working um in the the rag trade in in the textile industry in that area and i wondered how much solidarity was there between the different groups you mentioned there was like bangladeshi women working there turkish turkish kurdish and all of the kind of social mobilization that happened um was was there much kind of intersectional work there with those different women that you know of Oh, you need to unmute yourself. I can't hear you. Um, it's a very interesting question because it is surprisingly there is no interaction at all. I mean, I asked um, how they were communicating in the factory, whether they were sharing the food, for example. It is um, during the because they were talking about uh, during the lunchtime how they were sharing the food between themselves, and I was asking whether um, they were sharing the uh, you know having interaction with those Bangladeshi women, Pakistani women, uh, the other minority women, and. All of them, apart from one, said no interaction at all. 
they were just saying hi um, and bye, that's it. Um, and it was, one of them actually said that it was like a map, the factory was like a map uh, of United Nations. You had all kinds of different minority groups, but they have their own territory. So they were sitting in different corners as a group. Um, and they didn't have interaction. And it is very interesting because um, Hackney is time to time like that as well. You know, yeah, you have that social, uh, it is, it, you know, Hackney is, is, is an example as a super diverse uh, borough, um, which means that so many diverse groups live together um, in a convivial way. So that conviviality actually uh, brings them together and enables them to live in peace. But that conviviality is a, it has a social distance very similar to uh, the social distancing we had um, during COVID, for example. You know, we were walking on the same pavement, but we were um, making sure that we don't actually uh, invade each other's space. We don't look look at each other. If anyone coughs, we hide ourselves. So that kind of social distancing constantly goes on. The communities live together. They coexist in the same place, but then the interaction between them is um, not as much as uh, the super diversity suggests. Yes, I totally uh, understand that. And I, I suppose if you live in London, probably whatever area of London, you you know a bit about that kind of feeling, right? That, you know, you might live on one end of the street and there's someone with a very different life to you who can be three houses down the road. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, ben, you've got a question for Marianne. Uh, yes, Marianne. Um... I was asking myself if there was already a point where um, you was you were able to confront the government with um, those numbers and how they would respond to it or how they want to actually um, respond to the um, consequences of the pandemic, especially towards women and single mothers. That's a really good question. Thank you. Um, we've done a lot of work. I mean, we obviously, you know, present our, you know, send our, our research to government and ask for meetings with them. We do sometimes get meetings with ministers and officials, um, uh, less so with the Treasury than, than some departments. Um, what we've been doing a lot of and what we did a lot of during the pandemic was um, trying to raise things via um, parliamentary select committees because they're in a position to hold um, ministers to account and, and call them in. Um, and for example, the Women in Equality Select Committee did um, a big inquiry into the impact of COVID on um, all different groups with protected characteristics under the, the Equality Act. Um, and their report drew quite heavily on some of our work and was quite critical of the government. Um, and to be honest, when they had um, the Ministers for Women in and they were um, talking to them, um, the response suggested that the government didn't really understand kind of what a gendered impact was. So they would say things like, oh, yes, but we put some money into this or we put some money into that. They wouldn't actually engage with the kind of underlying problem. I mean, this issue of um, childcare is interesting because I think there is a space now at the moment for more um, work on childcare because employers and employer organisations have started to see how affected they are by their staff not having childcare. You know, we've always said that, you know, childcare is not just a benefit to parents and children, it's a benefit to all of us. You know, if I want to see my GP and she can't get childcare that day, then she's not going to be there for me to see her. You know, um, that's why we call it social infrastructure. It, it's as fundamental to the economy as roads or rail. Um, and I think employer organisations really saw that when schools and nurseries were closed and suddenly their employees were having to rejuggle their work or requesting going on furlough or not able to do things, which means I think that there is a space to start 
pushing for investment in childcare because the, the childcare system in the UK is in crisis. I mean, it's it's vastly expensive compared to uh, many other European countries, but there's also real shortages of childcare in large parts of the country. I mean, in London, it's not so obvious because London is so dense that, you know, within a, a, a short radius of your house, you've got such high levels of population that it's easy to, to find some childcare service, whether, whether or not you can afford it is another issue. But if you live in a rural area, sometimes there just isn't any childcare available at all. It's not a case of it being unaffordable. It's that there isn't anywhere that you can get to. Um, and so we really need to address that. Thank you. And that last question, is it Chidem? I, I, um, you asked a question um, about um, the, the after effects of COVID now, you know, now we're kind of, it's, it's easing off and, and maybe kind of what are the priorities? I mean, Laura, I don't know if you want to mention about the Girls Friendly Societies and the effects that you're seeing and maybe what your kind of priorities are now people are going back to workplaces and things on the families and the girls, I suppose, that you work with? I think I think for the girls, um, it's absolutely critical that we um, deliver um, our uh, programme, which is all essentially all around mental health and developing strong, confident, resilient um, girls and young women. And what we have seen um, since COVID um, is um, increased demand at our groups and certainly our new groups which are in areas of deprivation um, and the also the, a huge increase in requests for bursaries so we don't charge very much at GFS anyway it's just two pounds um, a week but we have seen more and more groups um, support more and more girls with not charging anything at all so um, and, and that for for parents to not pay a two pound fee is huge. You know that, that no parent wants to not pay. You know, you um, you actually, in my experience, I've, I've just seen people that can't afford to pay, trying desperately to pay. Um, but um, we've seen a huge change in that. And, um, and so for us, um, the impact for us, when we're trying to grow and meet the, the, the burgeoning need, we also need to drive hard for fundraising to be able to, to um, to be able to address that that need as well. So I, I would say for us, it's about delivering that program um, to make sure those girls are supported and make sure that we deliver our growth plan to, to, to meet the very real needs of girls and their families. Thanks, Laura. Um, well, thank you everyone for spending um, this evening with us. And just thank you again to the speakers. That was absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much for taking your time to do that. Um, yeah, and um, happy Ant International Women's Day. And I hope that um, you will kind of have been kind of inspired to maybe get a bit more involved or support some of these organisations and speakers too. And please do keep in touch with the Meeting House. As I said, we have all sorts of programming on. So whether you're into your films or into your talks or into your history, there'll be something for you. Um, thanks everyone again and have a lovely evening.